Hello, everybody. How are you? Uh, it's very nice to be able to see all of you again. And I just wanted to say this is our official collaboration with MathCalc. And with MathCalc, what we are doing is we're going over the questions in their state competition from this year. If you were with us earlier, we did this on Sunday for some of the questions. And so today we're going to do questions that we didn't talk about on Sunday. Today, I'm also joined by another wonderful co-host, Eric Chan. Eric is- Hello. Yeah, Hello. Yes, that's me. Well, Thanks, thanks for jumping in, Eric, because that's the way that it makes the video switch across. So Eric is going to be our co-host for tonight. We were originally going to have Vivian, but unfortunately, Vivian has jet lag right now. She just got back from Europe. But regardless, really great to have Eric. Eric, like me, is from a state that starts with a W. Can you guess which it is? There are only four choices. But, oh yes, people are typing, this is awesome. So we see questions, I see people typing all kinds of things, but you're only guessing Wisconsin and Wyoming and West Virginia, come on. No one has guessed the correct state yet. Oh, here we go. Here we go, here we go, Washington, oh, Washington. Oh, oh that's Washington right. State. It's also Washington DC, but it's Washington State. So, so Eric was one of the top four in Washington State when he did the, sprint, when he did the state competition. And so we're very happy to have him here. Now, the way that we're going to run this show is that we're gonna go over some of the questions. And, uh, let's see, I guess I need to go and start switching to a question so I can start talking about this. Hmm, the answer is four. Well, actually that's just because that's a, that's a question from last time as we were talking. But in order to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and jump ahead to a question that we have not done, that we did not do last time. So here we go. There were a bunch of questions that we had discussed last time. I'm just going ahead. Okay, I'll start with this one. This one, unfortunately, has a lot of things to read. Uh, I see that some people have asked me questions like, what is nine plus 10 or 19? Now, we, we won't quite be doing those. Those are, are for a different kind of live stream. But just a second, let me do this too, so that we have a little bit of a better visual effect. All right, Brian has earned 65%, 80%, and 92% on his three pre-final exams. These exams are not weighted equally. The lowest counts for only 20% of his overall grade, while the other two count for 25% each. That doesn't add up to 100. Oh, if the final exam is the remainder, oh, good, good, good. The remainder of the official grade, of the overall grade, and there are no opportunities for extra credit, what is the highest grade Brian can earn in the class? All right, well, I guess what that means is we're just going to say, let's suppose that Brian got a perfect score on the, on the very last exam. And the way that, you calculate these weighted averages. As you say, well, for 20% of the overall grade, ooh, I'm trying to think now, do I want to use decimals or fractions? I prefer fractions. So for 20%, which is one fifth of the overall grade, uh, that's what, oh, whoa, they're not weighted equally. The lowest counts for only 20%. So the lowest is the 65%, okay, plus, and then the other two count for a quarter each, 25% each. One quarter of 80% plus one quarter of 92%. Oh, and then there's the rest. He could get 100 on the rest. Well, what's the rest? I have one fifth and one half. I'm going to do some scratch work. If I take one fifth plus one half, so far that is over 10, two tenths plus five tenths, which is seven tenths. So that means there's three tenths left. So plus three tenths of 100%. I'll just write it out here, even though it's going to be easy to multiply out and write a normal number. That's what I've got so far. And now I just need to add all of this together. Let's see. So the good news is I actually see that I can divide. The divisions are going to be nice. So this is going to be 13% plus 20% plus quarter of 92. Hmm. Four times two is eight, four times three is 12. And then I have a 30% here. And now is the hardest part. We have to add all these numbers together. Hmm. Well, 13 and 20 is 33, 56, 86. Eric, does this look okay? Uh, should be. Let's I see. Think. I see somebody else also doesn't know addition. That makes two of us. Great. I survived. Eric. Is yeah, right. yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay. Let's see. I don't think we actually did 13 last time. So I guess we could go back to that one then. Oh yeah, it's gonna be safe to just go forward. And then at some point we'll like halfway through or, or maybe a third of the way through, we'll just like go backwards from the top, the top questions. Yeah, that, that, that's a good idea. So 
Oh, I see absolute value is my least favorite type of equation. If the absolute value of 2x minus 1 is equal to the absolute value of x minus 2, what is the sum of all possible values of x? Now, the thing with absolute values is if you have one absolute value, that's pretty easy to deal with. If you have multiple, then just using casework is going to be a huge mess. So what I like to do with when I see these shorter problems is make a little graph here. So my graph, beautifully drawn coordinate axis. And then this condition of these two graphs being equal to each other simply implies that um, the intersections of the two individual graphs, y equals 2x minus 1 and y equals x minus 2. I have two graphs. And maybe I should change my colors for these. Yeah, give me a second. So one of these graphs is the other graph here. And so if I get rid of the problem now, because we don't need it anymore, Whenever these two expressions are equal is when their y coordinates are going to be equal, and that's going to be equivalent to a um, to, to an intersection. Let me change the color of my coordinate axis because it's kind of hard to see sometimes. Let me fix that real quick. You know, when you have chroma key and stuff, it likes to mess with your drawings. Hopefully that's a little better. But anyways, okay. So... Our first graph, y equals 2x minus 1. And the way you sort of graph absolute values is always has to be greater than 0. So what I like to do is I graph the function first. So it's going to have a, so this is negative 1 here, right? I have a slope of 2. And this is going to be the original line without absolute values. And with absolute values, the negative part just gets flipped up. So like something like this. And then my second graph, my yellow graph, is going to be here. Right, and x minus 2 um, is going to be, so this is negative 2 here, right? So I'm going to have something like this, I think that's going to be my line. And then yellow, and then I, once again, I'm just going to flip this up. So there's going to be an intersection up here somewhere, because this is a slope of 1 of, of 2, and this is a slope of 1, so they're going to intersect here. There's an intersection here. And I'm, I think those are my two only intersections here. Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So now that we have this, now you can't probably can't eyeball this, but the point is I've isolated where these intersections are. One of these is on positive and negative here. One of these is negative and negative. I don't know if that kind of makes as much sense as it does in my head. But so this point up here corresponds to when this equation is flipped and this equation is also flipped. So basically what it's trying to say, I think it should be negative, negative of 2x minus 1. That's my green equation. It has to be equal to negative, remove this, negative x minus 2. And so I solve this. So I can actually get rid of the minus signs because they're applied to both sides. Uh, move, move x should be negative 1. Is that true? Yeah, x is negative 1, and this is 3. It's a badly drawn diagram, so it doesn't look like 1, which is why I always go back and actually solve for them. And then this equation, this one is a little easier to find. In this case, this equation is still flipped. The green equation is not flipped. You can see it's on the actual line itself. So in this case, my equation is 2x minus 1 is equal to negative x minus 2. I solve that. I get 3x is equal to 3, or x is equal to positive 1. And they ask for the sum of all my positive values of x. So our answer should be zero. Yeah, I think that's it right. Is. I think that's right. Actually, let me see. So, so I, I think that's also interesting because it didn't say express your answer as a common fraction. So I was worried at first. It's like, ooh, are we going to be able to have no fractions? Because there's two. But awesome. Yeah. OK. I guess I'll go on. What do we have next? Oh, geometry. A convex polygon has vertices at the points 2, 0, 1, 0, 1, 5, and minus 2, 4. What is the area of the polygon? Oh, boy. So I'm going to say I know something here called the shoelace theorem. Uh, we don't have enough uh, time in this quick live stream to prove everything to people, unfortunately. So I'll just say if you're interested in this, there are classes that will teach you this. Uh, we might even teach you this in our classes. But uh, you can take classes from anyone. And if you look up the shoelace theorem, it will tell you a way to tie your shoes. Uh, not really. But so, so now you, you multiply, oops, oops, oops. I need to make a copy. Let me make a copy of the two zero over here. Okay. So then I'm going to take all of these products. Let's multiply all of these pairs of numbers together. That gives me, oh, two times zero is not two. 
that is zero. This is five, this is four, and this is zero. Then I'm going to do that the other way as well. Oh, make sure the points are in order, someone said. Did I screw up already? So far, I think it's okay. The points are in order, okay? And then I go the other way. Let's do this, and I do the multiplications. I like all these zeros. This makes shoelace theorem very nice. Zero times anything is zero. So then this is uh, minus 10, and this is four times two is eight, okay? Then what you do next is you just add up. So this side is going to be negative two. You add up the other side. This is nine. Some, somehow I'm no longer happy. Why am I getting a fraction? And now you're supposed to subtract the two, take the absolute value and divide by two. But I'm getting 11 over two. Uh-oh, Eric, help. Oh, uh, wait, one times. Uh, I think it's still the order. Wait, two, that'd be in counterclockwise. Oh, it's because it's just telling me those. Thanks, can, can you? Let's plot it. Wait. Can you use a, can you shoelace on a concave polygon though? No, it'll give you a funny oriented area. So that won't work. So the thing is, I actually assumed that these are in the order. I just assumed that, that math counts gave us the points in the order, but thank you for telling me there might not, they might not be in order. So let's see. So two zero, that's here. This is two zero. I also have a one zero. I have a one five. And I have a negative two four. So actually the order that I want is going to do something like this. Oh boy. So it actually goes from two zero, which is this one here. Two zero is followed by one zero, okay. But that's not followed by one five. That's followed by negative two four, and then it's followed by one five. So in that case, let's do this and fix it. And by the way, you can see what I just did here. As I was trying to error check my work, I was like, math counts didn't say to find a common fraction. So if it doesn't say common fraction, then it's gonna be a whole number. So now let's do this again. We had two, zero, one, zero, negative two, four, and then the one, five. Wow, this is tricky. Then the two, zero. Okay, now let's tie shoes. So this thing gives me a zero. This thing gives me a four. This thing gives me a negative 10, and this will give me a zero. I'll add these together and get minus six. Let me go the other way. So this gives me a zero, this gives me a zero, this gives me a four, and this gives me a 10. That adds up to 14. Now I subtract the two, 14 minus negative six, that gives me, I'll take an absolute value and divide by two, but that gives me 20 over two. I think I get 10. What 10, yeah, that's what I got too, yeah. It sounds like you did it a different way then. Yeah, with the correct diagram on my screen this time, because I may not have read four as negative four. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I split those into two triangles. Obviously, if you don't know Shulis theorem, this will probably be your fastest way to do it. Shulis theorem also works wonderfully as well, especially if you have zeros, like Professor Lo has mentioned. And the answer is 10, I think. So Cool. Well, you're next. All right, let's see what I have. Well, again, we have not seen these problems before, as we shouldn't have, but OK. Let x is greater than zero, y greater than zero. Suppose that, okay, it's on the screen. Suppose that x, y squared is equal to six and x squared y to the sixth power is 72. What is the value of x, y? Oh, this is interesting. Okay. All right, now there's a trick we can use to get rid of all the multiplying and powers in this equation. And in fact, it's actually something that um, historically, like by historical, I mean 4,000 years ago, people were using. And when you do big multiplications, I mean, even up to before we had like calculators and stuff, what they would do is they use logarithms, right? And the neat thing about logarithms is that, if I, let me draw here, the log, log of AB, right? is equal to log A plus log B, no matter what base you're in, right? Hopefully people don't know this theorem. The important part is it lets us split multiplication into addition. So basically what they would do is you have two big numbers, one, two, three, four times five, six, seven, eight. You will look up the tables. Like they have huge tables of logarithms. You find the log of one, two, three, four, log of five, six, seven, eight, add them, that's easy, and then convert back, right? Anyway, what we're doing with this problem is I see all this multiplication. I could work with the multiplication, but I find it kind of a pain. So I'm just gonna, 
take the log of both of these equations here, right? So my first equation becomes, and you'll see that the base of my logarithm won't actually matter when I'm going to convert it back. So I'm just going to use log base 10 because I don't like writing little numbers down here. Um, and we have my second equation. So now I can work with these and I can split them basically. So let me work with this. So my first equation becomes log x plus 2 times log y is log 6. I'm writing on my slides a little bit. Hang on. Um, it, it's it's over it's over concrete, but the point I'm just trying to say is that you could still do this with the uh, with normal means, but this kind of makes it clear because when we're doing uh, equations like this, uh, what we like to do is we like to um, basically manipulate them without solving for x and y directly. And so I just want to turn this into a. Am I doing this right? Yeah. Uh, so far, so yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. So far, so good. Okay. Uh, do I? Am I going to have to find one of these? Let me think for a second. So if log, you want log x plus log y. That yeah that yeah that's what I, okay I would need to take the negative of this equation that's what I need to do so if I want log x minus log y in some proportion I'm gonna take minus oh man this is annoying so honestly it would be faster to solve for x and y directly at this point right than try to come up with this. Well, I've already doomed myself in this hole and I'm going to get myself out of it. So <laughs> we're going to do it this way. <laughs> so my strategy is I'm going to multiply this in first entire equation by A and my second entire equation by B. If you're working with X and Y, that'd be a cool to take you to some power. Um, anyways, um, basically I want to pick A and B such that when I add these two multiplied equations together, I'm left with log X plus log, log Y. So I have a plus 2b, that needs to be equal to 1, and then 2a plus 6b also needs to equal 1. That's quite literally what I'm doing when I say this has to be log x, this has to be log y here. So I'm solving this way easier system of equations. As I see, 2a plus 4b is equal to 2, and I subtract that. So b is going to be equal to negative, uh, is that right? Negative 1 half? I think so, yeah. b is equal to negative 1 half. That would be a would be equal to two. Okay. So I go back up here. So two log x plus four log y is equal to two log six. Negative one. Uh, okay, that works. That I think it's it going to work. It's going to work. Okay. We, we believe here. Okay, so let's. Can I erase this? I want to see what's the best way to deal with this. Okay, I'm going to get rid of all this down here. I'm going to keep. A and B is going to work, trust me on this. Um, 2 log x plus 4 log y is equal to 2 log 6. I'm multiplying it by A, and then my bottom equation multiplied by negative 1 half. Negative log x minus 3 log y is equal to negative 1 half log 72. And now you can see what I've done is because when I add these two equations now, not move, don't move it around, Eric. When I add these two equations, they are going to completely cancel. I get log x plus log y is equal to uh, this on the right hand. So 2 log 6 is log 36 uh, minus whatever this is. Uh, yeah, I think this is going to work. So I'm going to show you the way faster way to do this after this because I realized that this is actually the really slow way. But log xy is going to be equal to log or 36 over square root of 72. I'm going to simplify that a little bit. So 72 is 6 squared, 6 root 2. So I get, so that's actually 6 over root 2, which is actually 3 root 2. So xy is equal to 3 root 2, I think. It is. Oh, it man. All right. Now let me show you the fast way to do this, because it's not this way. <laughs> OK. You actually suck it up and solve for y, right? My first equation, x, y squared, I square it. x squared, y fourth is 36. My second equation, they're given x, y, y, x squared, y sixth is 72. I get y is equal to the square root of 2. Plug that back in. 
right? y to the fourth is now four, I get x is equal to three. Three times square root two is three root two. Wow, okay. That actually is a, is a different way. I did, I did not think of that way. I just wanted to make a comment. A lot of people were saying, why is Eric doing logs? Well, you know, some people were like, I just see that you should like divide this equation by that thing squared. Well, that works if you just can see it. But guess and check doesn't always work. And so what Eric was doing is he was doing the systematic way that you'd actually be able to crank through any one of these, even if you're not lucky. But yeah, this last thing that you did is also very fast. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm next. What's next? Oh boy, we like roots now. This can't be so bad. Let's just square stuff, uh, hopefully. Famous last words. Let's go and see. So uh, yeah, so if this is true, let's square both sides. 7 minus the square root of 2 plus the square root of n is equal to 4. Maybe this is not that bad. Square root of 2 plus the square root of n is equal to 7 minus 4 is 3. 9 equals 2 plus the square root of n. Wait, are you serious? Is it just 49? It is just 49, I think. I think this is just not fair. Somehow I got this question, Eric got the other one. All right, well, Eric, you're next. Oh, man. OK, this question here. How many integers between 1 and 280 inclusive are not divisible by 2, 5, or 7? Oh, no. OK, what's the fastest way to do this? So this is, we're going to use pi, not the pi pi, the pie pi, principle of inclusion and exclusion. So to help visualize this better, I'm going to draw a quick diagram here. So my big box here, so this is probably a Venn diagram. You guys have all seen this before, hopefully, if you're at state math counts. Um, this big box represents all numbers between 1, uh, 1 and 280. This circle represents all numbers divisible by 2. This circle represents all numbers divided by 5. This one, all numbers divisible by 7. What we want? We want this area in the box outside of all three circles. And so how are we going to count that? We're going to have to count how many numbers are inside the circles. Well, step one is just we're going to have to add up the numbers in each one of the circles. So how many numbers between 1 and 280 are divisible by 2? That's simple, 140. 280 divided by 2. How many of them are divisible by 5? 56. How many of them are divisible by 7? 40. OK, but we're not done yet. Because if you look at this area here, well, what do we do to it? We counted well, we counted this area once where we counted all numbers divisible by 5. Then we counted it again where we counted all numbers divisible by 7. So we're actually counting this number twice, which is bad. We only want to count it once. The idea is we always want to count these numbers once. So how many numbers are divisible by 5 and 7? That's equivalent to saying how many numbers are divisible by 35, because 5 and 7 are relatively prime. That's important to remember. 280 over 35 um, is 8. OK, well, the same thing applies to this little region here. How many numbers are divisible by 14? 20 of them. And then this region here, how many, how many are divisible by 10? The answer is 28. And we're not quite done yet, because this little section in the center, let's see what we did. We counted it once when we counted all numbers divisible by 2, once for the 5, once for the 7, so that's three times. Then we uh, removed once when it we counted, we subtracted numbers divisible by 10, we removed it once when we counted all numbers divisible by 14, and we removed it once when we counted by all numbers divisible by 35. So now we need to count it once more again. So we have to add it back. Add it back. Um, how many numbers are divisible by 2, 5, and 7? Well, how many numbers are divisible by 70? The answer is just 4 there. And so what we can do here is we're just going to plug and chug through these numbers. So 196 plus 40 is 236. Um, 236 minus 8 is 228. Minus 28 is 210. Minus 20 is 190. Plus 4 is 190, 194. OK, so there's 194 things that are within the circle. Have to be careful. These are numbers that are within my set of three circles. We want the numbers that are not divisible, which means that we have to subtract that from 280, which gets us 96, which is the answer. I also mentioned, I saw someone in the chat mention, mention a phi function. Now, phi function is kind of advanced it's for high school level, but you can use this uh, to demolish this problem. And so. <laughs> Uh, let me just quickly explain what, what phi function is. Phi, Greek letter here, phi of a number 
simply denotes how many numbers are relatively prime to that number, aka don't share factors with their number, aka their greatest common divisor is 1, aka, yeah, that's basically it. I can't think of any more synonyms. But for example, phi of 8 would be 1, 3, 5, 7, because those are the numbers relative to prime, relatively prime to 8. There's four of them, so 5 of 8 is equal to 4. Now, there's a couple of special properties with this function. Property number one is that for any prime number, phi of p is p minus one. So phi of three would be two, five of five would be four, five of seven would be six. As long as there's prime, you can probably see that because all the numbers less than the prime are going to be relatively prime to it by definition of a prime, right? So that, that's condition number one. And the other really powerful is that it's multiplicative. So phi of m in, as long as m in are relatively prime, is equal to m phi of m times phi of n. So we say 5 of 280 is going to be equal to phi. Now we're going to break it down into factors, right? How many factors of 4? 2 does it have? Well, it's 4 times, um, is that? No, it's way more than 4. Come on. Uh, 140, 70 is 8. OK, 8 times phi of 5 times phi of 7. Yeah, that looks right. So 8 times 5 times 7, relatively prime, multiply to 280. So we just found, by my example, 5, 8 is 4. Hang on, 4. 5 of 5 is also 4. 5 of 7 is 6. 16 times 6 is 96. Again, our answer. Have to be careful when using this, though, because if it's asked not divisible by 2, 3, or 5, you can't use this anymore because 3 is not a factor of 280. This only works in this very special circumstance because 2, 5, and 7 embody all of the prime divisors of 280. That's why we could use this special trick in this particular problem. Yeah, this is pretty good. This is pretty good. And thanks very much for, uh, for all the people in the chat for talking about the phi. I just wanted to throw one other thing out on this question, which I, I saw somebody saying, let's multiply some fractions. So if you remember, Eric had these numbers up here. Like he had all these numbers. These were all his numbers that we had to like add and subtract and stuff. And at the end, he said, oh, oh, oh but wait, you got to remember, subtract the whole thing from 280. If you subtract the whole thing from 280, let's go and flip all the signs. I'm just saying like the answer to the whole question is this. I'm flipping all the signs. Oh, I know how to flip a minus sign to a plus sign. You just do that. Okay. Oh, now I know how to flip a plus sign to a minus sign too. Anyway. All right. So now, now I have this. So this is the answer to the whole question. But actually, this factors 280 times 1 over 1 minus 1 over 2, 1 over 1 minus 1 over 5, 1 over 1 minus 1 over 7. Actually, what you're seeing here is this is related to the proof of the Chinese remainder theorem. And this is also related to the PIE principle of inclusion exclusion. That was actually, that's actually how you go about getting the Chinese remainder theorem in this case. And it's also related to the phi function because it turns out that in this particular problem, this is, this is what you're trying to do. You're trying to find a number of numbers less than the 280, which are relatively prime to it. But if you write this out, that is the, that is the product that you saw some other people write. And actually, now you can see there are certain cases in which this always works. Remember when, when Eric was saying, you got to be careful when you use the phi function. Like over here, we were lucky. The 2, 5, and 7 are the only prime factors of 280. But then what we wrote here, actually what's going on is that there are no rounding downs. And actually, in actuality, when you do these kinds of problems, you have to be like, how many things are multiples of like 10 up until 273? You have to round down. But here, I don't need to write a single round down. And that's why it factorizes. So whenever these things that you're avoiding here all are factors of that, even if they don't have all of the factors of that, as long as they are factors of that, then it turns into something like that. And then you can always just split it apart. Yeah, I don't want to spend like too much time on this problem, but uh, one thing you can see, kind of see the flipping fractions part of it, is that what Professor Lowe had just written uh, on his screen was 280 times what was a one half times two uh, four fifths times six sevenths is what that's equivalent to here. And so I guess this is the mentality a lot of you have where you like flipping fractions, right? Because we look at all the numbers divisible by two, right? Well, every other number is going to be divisible by two, so the numbers that how many of the total that we want is one half of that. Now, out of these remaining numbers, every fifth number is divisible by five. So the four remaining numbers we can keep. That's the four fifth fraction. And then out of every seven numbers, one of them is divisible by seven. So there's six left that we could keep. So there's actually so many ways you could do this problem. Some are way faster than others. 
this is probably the fastest method. But you know, in an actual competition setting, you might not come up with this first try. So yeah. And thanks, thanks, Eric, for putting that out. I mean, I ultimately what we were trying to do is just like see that there are lots of fun ways to do it. And because of your chatting, you are able to help point us in all these directions. Because we haven't seen these problems before, you see. Oh, okay. Speaking of problems we haven't seen before, let's start going from the high end. This is where we get burned. So we might need your help, uh, all of you in the chat, because these get hard. So let's see, what's this? Question 27. If m and n are positive integers, where m squared plus 14m minus 32 is a power of 3, is 3 to the n, what is the value of m plus n? So first of all, it doesn't say find all values. So that means I just need to find something that works. OK, I see a quadratic. I feel like factoring it. It's just like, maybe there was a quadratic meant to factor. Oh, it's factorizable. That's good. OK, so if it's factorizable, then I should be able to be like, it's m plus 16 m minus 2 is a power of 3. Oh, so then that's telling me I need to go and find, yeah, yeah, I see that people already in the chat are saying like, you know, maybe there's always a quadratic to factor or something. But in this particular case, I'm like, I think I just need to find, in order to multiply two numbers and get a power of three, they both have to be powers of three. So I need to have powers of three that are exactly 18 apart because I have plus 16 and a minus two. Are there powers of three that are 18 apart? Well, they're probably not too big, right? So like, what are the powers of three? One, three, nine, 27, oh, oh, there we go. Those are 18 apart. So that's telling me that I want this to be 27. That was supposed to be a two. This is supposed to be 27. This is supposed to be nine. It looks like 11 might be the case for M. And then now what's N? What power of three do I get? Maybe you guys can type into the chat. So what do I have for this? I have three cubed, I have three squared. I'm getting three to the fifth. And M plus N is 16, is it? Should be. It is, yeah. Yay! Okay, I got lucky. Let's continue going backwards. Eric, you're up next. Oh my god, why do you get all the easy ones? What is this? <laughs> okay. Let's look at this nightmare. If 7 squared plus 24 squared to the power of 4 times 5 squared plus 10 squared to the power of 5 times 75 squared plus 100 squared to the power of 6 is 5 to the one's power. Okay, that doesn't actually look that bad. Okay. So we're going to deal with this term by term. My first term, 7 squared plus 24 squared, is a famous Pythagorean triple. That is equal to 25 squared. That was easy. So my first term is 25 squared to the power of 4. And since they want it in the right side is 5 to the n, well, then maybe I can just uh, write it in this form right now, right? So 25 is 5 squared. 2 times 2 times 4 is 16. So it's 5 to the 16th power. That's term number one. And you multiply by 5 squared plus 10 squared. That's interesting. So 5 squared is 25. 10 squared is 100. Well, that's 125 to the fifth power. Uh, 125 happens to be 5 cubed. So this is 5 to the 15th. OK. And 75 squared plus 100 squared. Now, with this term, what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out a, a factor of 25 squared and hopefully that makes it a bit more clear that now it's a three, four, five Pythagorean triple. And I'm not used to chat being this high up because you guys are very active. So I'm going to move this up a little bit. Yeah, so three squared plus four squared is 25. So 25 times 25 squared, that is 25 cubed. So 25 cubed. I don't know. I don't want to like make it. Uh, so it's a 25 cubed, this term, which is another five to the. Oh, no, I have you take it to the power of six. 6, right? 25 cubed to the power of 6, which is 2 times 3 times 6 is 36. Yes. And so then 5 to the 16 times 5 to the 15 times 5 to the 36. 16 plus 15 plus 36, 31 plus 36, 67. Uh, is that right? That is right. That is right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So it's not necessarily true that you got all the hard ones. So <laughs> it just looks scary. It looks scary. Yeah, sometimes like the most scariest looking problems are the easiest and sometimes the simplest looking problems are the hardest because they don't give you as much information. Absolutely. Okay, I guess I'm next. Number 25, what is the greatest integer k such that 80 factorial is divisible by 45 to the k? We seem to be liking powers right now. 
So I also see that people want us to go to the target problems. Maybe we can go to do that after, after this one. Um, or maybe it's up to us, maybe up to, up to Eric. You can decide, he'll be the one who drives next. So 45 to the K, that's three to the two K because that's a nine times five to the K, nine times five. So I really wanna know like, Am I going to have more fives or am I going to have more threes? Let's go and find out. So I now need to know in an 80 factorial, how many fives are there and how many threes are there? 80 factorial, how many fives? We actually did a question very related to this earlier as well. And so earlier meeting earlier, I think it was in live stream last time. And this is just by taking 80 divided by five, which is equal to 16. Then you take 16 divided by five, always round down, by the way. Rounding down didn't make a difference here, but that gives you three and there's no more because at, at that point, like three divided by five round down is zero. So the number of fives is equal to 19. But how many threes? The number of threes, I'll take 80 divided by three, round down. Uh, three times two is six, and then there's a 20. Three times six is 18. Then I'll take 26 divided by three, that's eight. Uh, eight divided by three, that's two when I round down. Add this all together. Eight plus two is 10, which is fun. And so this is 36. And so now what I see is, ah, the threes will be the hard ones to get. Because you see, I'm, with, I'm looking for the biggest power of a three squared times five to the first. Oh, I already skipped a step by telling you that. I want to know the largest power of a three squared times five to the first. Uh, that I can find to the power k. And so actually, if I have 36 threes, I can only do this to the power 18. And over here, I have 19 fives. So I could support a power 19 on the fives, but I, I need to go with the limiting reactant. That's how I think of it. So in that case, the answer is just going to be whatever happens when I take the 36 divided by two, I think. Is it? Whew. Okay, it is. It is, yeah. I guess we could maybe like one more spread that maybe go back to the target and come like back from eight and back. But anyways, so let's see what happens in store for me. If question 24, that's a counting problem. Thomas, Curry, and Lenny each captain a different one of three hockey teams. Each captain would choose four players from a pool of 12 players with each player chosen for only one team. How many different ways can the teams be four? First of all, I'm pretty sure hockey teams have way more than four people, but uh, neglecting that detail there, <laughs> ignoring that. <laughs> so 12 players, Thomas, Kari, and Lenny. So uh, is this how it works? Okay, I think this is how it works. Now, Thomas, Kari, and Lenny. Now, they could pick their players in any order they want, right? You can think of like drafting, right? But the idea is it doesn't really matter uh, what order the players are picked in because we're only counting how many groups are going to be formed at the end of it. It doesn't matter if A gets picked by Thomas and then B gets picked by Kerry or B gets picked by Kerry and A gets picked by Thomas, they're the same group, right? So let's just assume Thomas gets to pick all four of his people first. Now that's a huge advantage, but it doesn't matter because we're only counting how many ways you can actually do that. So he chooses four people out of 12 people. And so hopefully if you're in state math counts, you're, you're familiar with this notation, 12 choose four. So I'm choosing four things I shouldn't call people things, four people out of a group of 12 people. And then Carrie, Kari, Carrie, I don't know how to pronounce her name. Uh, she says four, she chooses her four people. And so she's choosing four people out of eight people. And then Lenny has to choose four people out of four people. A uh, very difficult decision to make. So he's gonna choose four from four. This term is just one, we all know that, right? He's just left with whatever's left. So we can ignore that, but we'll just write one. 12 choose four, now the formula is 12 factorial over eight factorial and four factorial. Um, you don't know this formula, um, let me get rid of the slides. There's several ways to go, uh, go to it. The idea is that it's gonna be 12 times 11 times 10 times nine ways to pick four people, but then it says the four people can be arranged however any way you want. You're gonna have to divide by four factorial. And the 12 times 11 times 10 times nine is just 12 factorial over eight factorial, like that. Um, anyway, that, that's, that's the quick rundown of the formula. So this is basically what we're trying to find. Um, is there a shortcut? I guess there is some shortcut. I can cancel, I can cancel this out. Do I want to cancel that out? I don't, I'm not sure if I want to cancel that out. 
because it's going to cancel with the 12 factorial. I think no matter how you do it at this point, it's going to work. Yeah, it's going to be a huge number, though, I can tell. Um, okay, let, let, let's do it this way, because I already went down this rabbit hole. So I'm going to expand 12 factorial. Um, the last term there is 4 factorial, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And I have 3 4 factorials on the bottom. And so I cancel one of these immediately. Now 4 factorial is 24, so this is 24 times 24 down here. Um, we could cancel out a factor of 12, I could cancel out a factor of 8, and then I could cancel out a factor of 6. Okay, cool. Ah, I'm just dropped my pen. All right, so what am I left with? Well, I am left with 11 times 10 times 9 times 7 times 5. Oh no, they don't give you a calculator on the sprint rounds, do they? So I guess we're going to have to find this ourselves. Now, I do see a quick way we could do this. Nine, 9 times 11 is 99. So this term here is 999. So I'm going to move the 10 out because that's the easy to, easiest to deal with. 99 times 7 times 5, which is going to be equal to 35 times 99, right? Which is equivalent to 3,500 minus 35, uh, which would be 3, 4, 6, 5. And then I have to attack on a 0 because I multiply by 10. That's my final answer there. Yay, that's right. Wow. Okay, I didn't make a calculation error. <laughs> that means that I now have to jump ahead and do the problems that actually use a calculator. Actually, for me, that's the least fun thing. I, I, I actually don't have a very good calculator here. So let's see, oops, I fell off. Let's see what happens. I just went, went to my, my face here because I don't want to show all these like random questions as I'm scrolling forward. But I'm gonna go to target number, oh, let's make it fair. I'll do target number two. Okay, because otherwise it's like I always throw the hard questions to Eric. Uh, so let's do this. I'll do target number two. And in case you haven't done the math counts before, why I said it's the harder question, the, the second question is the harder one. And actually, Eric, you can feel free to skip ahead through the questions whenever it's your turn too, uh, if you are bored <laughs> of doing it. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know, I know. Okay, what do we have? So ABCD is a square, side length is two centimeters. E is the midpoint of CD. Whenever I see something like that, I immediately go label one and one. It's just like, so I don't forget and don't make a mistake. All right. BF is perpendicular to AE. How nice. Uh, what is the area of ECBF? Let me highlight that. ECBF. Oh, that thing. Okay. So if I need to know this area, how would I do this? Hmm. Oh, I could... I could subtract out some areas and use some similar triangles. That's actually what I'm going to do here, OK? So it's a square. So I happen to have that. And this might not be the most efficient. Maybe Eric has a better way. But I'm just going to be like, that's two, that's two. But remember, I said something about similar triangles. So I'm like, I know how to find the area of that triangle. That's easy. Half base times height, OK? That area is easy. But what's the area of this triangle here? Well, I said there's something about similar triangles. So you see, if I mark this angle here, this angle is exactly the same as that angle. Does anyone know why? There's actually multiple reasons why that's true. Why are those two both pink? So those are the same for two reasons. One is you could think of them as parallel lines. Yeah, thanks. I see somebody, Stephen Chow said that, parallel lines, and then this goes uh, as a transversal. There's another way. It's that actually both of these are complementary to the same other angle. And that one I'm going to mark with yellow. Oh, look at that. I now have two triangles which have two pairs of corresponding congruent angles. So at that point, what that means is that these are similar triangles. So this piece is similar to that piece. This is a two. This thing here is a root five because it's a one, two, root five triangle. Okay, so let me write that down. So I have that AE is equal to the square root of five. And then somehow I've got this guy, which is only a two. Actually, what that means is that this entire triangle right here is a scaled down version of that big one, scaled down by a factor of two over root five. I mean, scaled by a factor of two over root five. So I'm just going to note that right here. This triangle is scaled uh, A, D, E by a factor of two over root five, but now that's very interesting. Does anyone know what happens to the area if I scale each side by something? If each side scales by two over root five, how does the area scale? It's nice. The area scales by the square of that. So the area is gonna scale by four over five. 
Yes, thanks. So thanks, Samuel, for pointing that out. So the area is the side is scaling by the side squared. So that means that the area is equal to square it four over five times whatever was the area of this thing. And the area of this thing was half base times height. Let me call this the base. That's easier. Half base is just one times height is one. So the area of the other triangle is a one. This has area one. Okay, so I have an area of one and I have an area of four fifths. We're almost done. Because the question says that I need to go and find the area here. So let's just subtract that from four. I have two times two, right? So in that case, the answer, the area is four minus one minus four fifths. We're supposed to do a decimal because it said decimal to the nearest tenth. So that's three minus 0.8. I think it's 2.2. Yes, it is. Cool. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I saw someone in the chat say that they tried to core bash this problem, uh, core bash and core inner bash. Um, it's not actually that bad, I think. It's The main trick is if you're going to use shoelace, like Professor Lowe said at like, the beginning of this class, right? Shoelace works best when you have a lot of zeros. So what I actually do with here is I set B as my origin. So B and C are now both zero. Then I find the coordinates of E, easy, F, moderately difficult. And then you can actually solve from there. And I think that gets you the same answer, I think. But yeah, that's, that's about that. Um, let's go back to target number one then. So, wow, that's a lot of text again. Stack of 10 cards on each nth card in consecutive letters, starting with the nth letter of the alphabet are printed. For example, on the first card, the letter A is printed. Okay, it's not that hard, right? Because I'm gonna have A and B, C. And C, D, E, then D, F, G, that's one, E, F, G, something, something, F, something, something, and then the 10th card, we have to, yeah, it's not going to loop back around or anything, so our answer is just, it's that sure easy. Loop around? The 10th card, like how many is it? The 10th card is going to start on the 10th letter, which means it's going to go to the 19th letter. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Wait, that's it. That's it? There's no way. Okay. Yeah, you did it. <laughs> this is, I guess it's number one. Oh, yeah, that's funny. Good for you. See, I was like, it's got to be harder than that. I misunderstood the question. I thought it just kept looping around. So I was like, that's what I thought too. Yeah. Yeah. Until they give us the examples. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. I guess I'm next. I'll go question three. Oh, wait, we're running out of time. So let's do this. I'm going to, I'll, I'll jump all the way to the end. I'll jump, to, I'll, jump, I'll jump to seven. Let me jump to seven. And then Eric can choose whether he wants to go to six or eight uh, or something. So here we go to seven. All right. The figure shows the responses for A, B, and C on a true false quiz, where T and F represent a response of true and false, respectively. It is known that a and B each got exactly seven questions correct. How many questions did C answer correctly? Wait, what? So it's known that A and B, ah, oh, oh wow, this is neat. Okay, so A and B each got exactly seven right. And then how many are, okay, okay. So now, now let's see. Oh, you can see I'm staring down at this, at this because I'm like, that's where my, that's where, that's where all of my display is. So, in some cases, they have disagreements. I'm just gonna start there. I'm gonna to go to the next screen because it says tables represented on the next screen. And it says A and B got exactly seven right. There are certain situations in which A and B gave different answers. If they gave different answers, exactly one of them is right. Is that gonna help me? I think so. So exactly seven questions are correct. So there are exactly 14 questions correct in total. This might not be the most efficient way you're just watching me think out loud. So in total, a and B got 14 questions right. And so I just made that these things are opposite and all of the ones that are opposite, there's exactly one. Okay, so now between the next ones, oh yeah, maybe this will do it. This is still not that nice. Okay, so, so right. So between the other ones, I'm gonna have to have 12 questions, right? And they all come in pairs, they both agreed. So in the rest of them, I guess what I'll say is that in the rest, rest are two, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Uh, they got 
12, right? And since they agree on everything, that means that six are right. I mean, six of their, their agreements are right, uh, of their agreements. Wait, that's obvious because, because what's going on here is that these, these guys disagree, okay? Interesting. Wait a second. This is a true false test. Each got exactly seven right, okay. Huh. Clive now, matches with Bernard. Okay, say again, uh, Eric's idea. helping me out. It's like Cl Clive's answers are the exact same as Bernard's for one and three. I think that's the only reason you're actually able to solve it. Oh my gosh. Okay, so is this underdetermined? Wait, so you just told me Clive and Bernard are doing what? Uh, so if Bernard, like out of number one and three, Bernard gets one correct, that means Clive will also get exactly one correct. Out of one and three. Yeah, out of one and three. Because oh, you don't actually know what the answers to one and three are. Yeah. Okay. Right. But I, if I look at Clive and the rest of them, does Clive like agree with people on the rest of them? Not really. But you do know the answers on the rest of them, though, I think. Yeah. Okay, you're obviously faster than me. So there, there's six right among the others. Oh, wait, they're all right. There's six of them. <laughs> wait, 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 hang on a second. So like, it's like I listed six of these things here. So but are, we, are we saying like all the rest of those are right? That they has have to be, be, yeah. Oh, wow, I didn't think of that. Okay, because I was like, oh no, how am I going to figure out which six of these are right? Oh, there's six of them. Okay, they're all right. Okay, that's good, that's good. So then that's how this works. Oh, what a nifty question. So I'm going to mark these in blue to just be like, blue means like that's the right answer, okay? So in that case, let's now just like say whether Clive is right or wrong comparing against the blues. So too bad for Clive on that one. Clive, you got that one wrong too. This is okay. Uh, this is also okay. No good for Clive, no good for Clive, I see. So then at that point, now we go and say, ah, okay. So now we're over here and we're like, Clive, which of these is right? And Clive is the same as Bernard, no wonder. So Eric, Eric's much faster than me. So Eric was like, okay, wait, Bernard got exactly one of these two right because Bernard's got seven right altogether. So since Bernard's got seven right altogether, exactly one of these two is right. Check it out, Clive copied Bernard, or maybe or maybe not. But what's going on here is among these two, since B has exactly one right here, so does C, since it's a copy. So that means that C has among those two an okay. And that gives, is it three? Did Clive only get three correct? I, I guess so, that's pretty bad, but. That's too bad, Clive. Three questions out of eight. So what you should do if you're ever copying Clive is you should just say the opposite of what Clive says. I'll get you a higher score, yes. <laughs> I mean, if you just randomly guess, you, your average is going to be higher than whatever Clive got. So that's kind of sad. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to go to question eight now. Oh, no. Oh, no. You know, good thing that, you know, I'm actually fast at number seven. So I have like five minutes left for question eight, you know? Uh, you know, positive thinking. Uh, polynomial P of X equals X quadratic X squared AX plus B has a positive integer coefficients A and B. Okay, if P of 60 is a perfect square and the equation P of X equals zero has at least two distinct integer solutions, what is the least possible value of B? Okay, uh, what I'm noticing here is that this probably looks scary, but the condition P of X, P X equals zero, just means that P X cannot be a square sum. Because if P of X is a square sum, that's just, it's gonna be a square number for whatever number I put in here, that's cheating. And we, and MathCows does not like cheating, uh, speaking from experience. No, I'm joking. That was a joke, but. Um, <laughs> so uh, basically, P of 60, I'm going to, it's a perfect square. I'm sorry, I'm writing on my slides here. Let's move this. It's a perfect square. I'm going to call that n squared, n for integer. And I'm just going to plug 60 into this equation. So 60 squared is 3600 um, plus 60a plus b is equal to n squared. Okay. Um, oh, I see how, how I have to do this. Well, if A and B have to be positive, that means that N squared has to be greater than 3,600, which is 60 squared. I might want to write this back down. And which means that if this is 60 squared, well, then N, the smallest value of N can be, has to be 61. So it has to be 61 squared. 
And so now what I have is 60 squared plus 60a plus b. Is b just going to be equal to 1 then? Wait, let's see. It's going to be 61 squared. Um, wait, can I do that? I, I, I think I can do that. Uh, it's kind of covering the question, I'm sorry. But um, 60a plus b is going to be 61 squared minus 60 squared. And difference of squares, that's going to be equal to 121 times 1, but we don't care about the 1. Um, that means that if I want the smallest possible value of b, well, then it's probably actually just turns into the finding the remainder of 121 when divided by 60, which means b is equal to 1. Is that easy? Wait, 60. Did you wait, use that the means. Fact, did you use the oh, fact wait. Fact? Oh, no. We have to. Oh, no. Because p of x has to have two distinct solutions. And what I just did was I got a equals 2 and b equals 1. And x squared plus 2x plus 1 is equal to x plus 1 squared. That's bad. That's not allowed. That's cheating. So now we have to have to go back and revise, uh, revise this plan. Now, I could make a equals 1 and b equals 61. But there's two problems with that. One that doesn't actually give me two integer solutions. And the other thing is that um, b is going to be massive. Am I doing this the right way? I might actually want to factor, factor this first. I think I do want to factor this first. I actually, because I could keep plugging in, like maybe this is going to be 62 squared, 63 squared, but I have no guarantee that what I'm going to get out of here is going to be a working solution within my time frame of five minutes I, that I used three minutes of already. Right, and also, this. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to do this yet either, but I'm looking at it and I'm like, but it's not clear that you want the perfect square to be as close as you can to 60 squared because like you want the B to be small, but you could get a, you could like have a big A. Yeah, thing. which is why I don't think, which is why I think we have to factor this actually. So I'm going to write xp of x uh, is going to be equal to two factors. So I'm going to say x minus um, variables, x minus p times x minus q. So my roots are x and q. We know that p and q are integer solutions and p does not equal q. For the problem and that, and which is 60 minus p times 60 minus q is a square number. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to run through the numbers in my head for a sec. So, oh, is this Simon's favorite factoring trick? This is very nice. I don't see how to use Simon's favorite, favorite factoring trick here. But this is a uh, really nice idea. I think your factoring is the way to go. Okay, I could, let's see. Could be, could be just a look, look at numbers close to. You want PQ product as small as you can. Um, I want, yeah, 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 yeah. You're right, yeah, yeah. Because B is equal to P times Q, so I want PQ to be as small as possible. Possible. It says B is positive. That means I will want both P and Q to actually be as small as possible. Like I can't get away with a negative number. Let me erase some of this so I have space. And let me get rid of the slide so you can read. All right. Um, oh no. So PQ small as possible which means i would probably want to consider numbers close to 60 right so let's go back to i don't know 55 56 57 50. Yeah, i'm going to disregard 59 because that's a prime disregard 61 as well um you don't need else. 61 anyway right because they're all you're subtracting are, are you just like trying to find two numbers which are close to 60 that multiply together to a perfect square yeah they have to actually be on the same side of 60 because pq has to be positive i don't know that makes sense same side as me either both p and q are positive or both p and q are negative oh you're right i missed that because b has to be positive okay um wait so this left hand side so we look at Oh, is this difference of squares? Oh, by the way, we'll know which side because it says A is also a positive integer. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah. If A is a positive integer, that means both P and Q have to be neg negative. Yes. Yes. So it has to be actually 60 plus P, 60 plus Q. You're right. So actually, we're going to disregard all the left side of this equation. Cool. Um, okay, that, help that helps a little. So if I have a... All right, I don't think I can guess this out of thin air. I'm going to try to do this somewhat systematically. So I'm going to expand this first. All right, 
right, let's, I'm going to try to move, move, move to a blank space and rewrite this real quick. 3600 plus 60p. And this is definitely not me stalling so I can think of something to do. Um, but uh, n squared. So p cannot equal, p cannot. Um, I could, oh, I think I see. Can I do that? I have, a, I have a random idea. I'm just like thinking at the same time while you're going. Um, I like what you did of like the 60 minus P, 60 minus Q, you turned them into pluses. What if we just started going like, all right, what if one of them is 63? What's the smallest other one that would complement me to get a square? You know what uh, I mean? Like if this guy is 63, then I've already got a nine, so I can ignore the nine. I have a seven left, I have to kill a seven. I'm not sure if this actually helps. But I'm just like, okay, from the 63, my partner will have to be whatever will have a perfect square times a seven. And the clear the closest perfect square times a seven, apart from 63, would be seven times four squared. I think. Maybe. So that, that would have to pair against uh, seven times four squared. And that's gonna give you something really big, because that q will be really big. This was 126, 112, I think. Maybe, but I'm, I'm just like, that's just huge. So I, I guess my thought process was just, all right, well, what if I try other things? What if it's a 64? If it's a 64, I don't have to kill anything. It's already a perfect square. So I just want the next perfect square. And that's a nice number, 81, right? I'm just like, I want to find two numbers which are close. And it, I already know that I won't have to do more than 81 on the left, I think, because like after I've gone so far on the left, uh, I'll always be trying to find another number which is bigger. Does that make sense? Maybe not. Uh, yeah, I guess. Like once you to reach a, I'm trying to think. So system, I could do modulo stuff on this. Could I? I could divide even odd cases. Um, n squared perfect square. Sixty one times. I mean, your way is the fastest way I can see right now. I mean, my way is just like, uh, it, it has to work eventually. And I'm hoping to learn a pattern while I go. Because as I'm going, I'm like, well, if I have a 66 for my, for my 60 plus P here, well, uh, 66 has no squares in it. So I can't save anything. So the only thing I can do here is I have to have something to get rid of everything in the 66 and I'll also have an extra square left over. So it's making me realize that we, we care most about the numbers that have squares in them. So like 67 is prime, you threw that away also. Uh, and then the next one would be 68. 68 has, how do you factorize this? There's a four, is it? Four times 23, it just sounds too big. But it's two seven? times. Uh, eight? No. It's, oh, it's four times 17. Four times, four times 17, times. thank you. So then I would do 17 times three squared crazy. as the next one. I mean, so far the 6481 looks juicy. <laughs> that, that, that's where I would guess. 68. 69, is that three times 23? That's just too big. big. It is three times 23, I think. That's too big. Go on, let me see. 70, it's gonna be like big, 70 times two squared. 71 is prime, oh, 72 is a cool number. Does everything go away except just a two? I think so. 72 is eight times nine. So everything goes away except a two. I just need to get an extra two. So two times a perfect square. Is there two times a perfect square which is bigger than 60? Two times 25, two times 36, that's 72. Two times 49. 98. 98. 98. 72, 98. 72, 98 is still bigger than 64, 81. I think we're going to get there. So it's like 73 is bad. 74 is just like feels big. Oh, 75. There's a three extra. So I need three times a perfect square. I guess that would be three times. Six squared? That's big. I'm just gonna say it's 64. I think it's 64 and 81. <laughs> I don't know. 21 and 38. I don't I don't like that because there's no systematic way, but it's also the only way I can think of right now. What is that? Makes 24, right? No, wait, I'm four and twenty-one, that makes twenty-five. As P plus Q. P time. Well they want P times Q. We want P times Q. So it's four times twenty-one. Eighty-four. And then 12 times 38 is way bigger than that. Because all the other ones feel like you're just getting too far out. 
I actually think this this is probably the systematic list in the sense that if I kept going, if you notice what I'm always doing, I'm listing like the smaller one and then the next one. And so actually, as soon as I got to 81, I would be already stuck with an 81 and something beyond. And I'm just like, there's not going to be another nice number between 75 and 81 anyway. Maybe 80, but like that's, that won't be good. I, I can't possibly expect an 80 and some other number to do better than 64 and 81. It's too close already. Yeah, especially because you're finding p times q, right? So like the difference between a four here, factor of four here, and a factor of five here is huge. So that oh, I didn't think about it that way. So you're actually, your only viable values, like for one term at least, is has to be close to 60. Because two terms that are relatively yeah. far apart is going to be way bigger. Oh, wow, I didn't think about that at all. You're totally right. Because like once you have the 64, it's like, it's only four, thank goodness. And everything else is like massive. So can we guess 84? I mean, we're out of time. That's the only way. We Let's do a review. Yay! <laughs> okay. Awesome. Uh, with that, I want to say thank you to everyone who came today. Uh, Eric, thanks for working with me. Uh, we managed to actually get up. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go home and try and keep thinking about this problem. Yeah. <laughs> what That's a nightmare. Fantastic. Okay. Well, with that, let's thank everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Math Counts, for the collaboration. You always make very interesting questions. Real pleasure to work with you. I hope that all of you who came here had some fun too. But with that, we're going to call it a wrap. It's going to be a, this, that's a wrap for the state Math Counts competition. Do we dare to do a live stream of the national competition? We'll see. We can talk to Math Counts about that. But have a good night, everyone. <laughs>